All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Masari's Unqualified Opinions. I'm Ryan Selkis, at 2 Bit Idiots. Very excited for another huge interview uh, with the CTO at R3, Richard at Gendel Brown. We were just talking about uh, the fact that he never introduces himself by three names. Uh, but Richard Brown is at Gendel on Twitter. He is one of the uh, savviest explainers of blockchain technology, I, I, I'd say. And, and it's originally how he and I got to know each other way back in 2014, because I'd syndicated some of his one-on-one content explaining how these structures work, how they could be used for enterprise. Uh, and it comes from an enterprise background. So we're, we're going to get into uh, quite a bit um, about the origin story of R3 and, and how you know Richard got into the industry. And then obviously want to spend quite a bit of time um, talking about the intersection between enterprise and uh, tokenized assets, which you know for for many years now has seemed like it's on a completely different trajectory and parallel path. Yeah, on the on the one side you had like settlement and clearing and supply chain logistics all tokenless on the enterprise side, and then you had a bunch of cryptocurrencies and work tokens and ICOs uh, on the public side. We're starting to see more of an intersection. And so we're going to talk quite a bit about uh, the two areas of intersection that may be most relevant in the near term, uh, tokenized securities and then central bank digital currencies. Um, but before we get into all that, uh, the, we, we have to have a little bit of orientation for uh, Richard, your background, uh, how, how you kind of got into the industry full time and what the evolution has been, um, not just for you personally, but specifically in your role at R3 and, and where the company has come since founding. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me. And it's great to catch up again. Like you say, it was all those years ago we were we were sharing sharing notes and um, and you were syndicating my content. So, so yeah, so my my career before R three was entirely in the enterprise space, in fact, entirely at one company, IBM. So I, and I thought I thought I'd be institutionalized there, but uh, but I was eventually persuaded to leave by, by R three. And and I guess the, the reason why is possibly you know, hopefully interesting. So I guess you know, like everybody, everybody's got a sort of backstory for when they, they first discovered um, Bitcoin and the, the whole rabbit hole they went down. Um, and, and I was like, 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 like all the others did the same thing. Um, and, and what I realized, and maybe this is the stepping off point for me and you know, where, how I ended up where I am, was I realized it, I, could, I could use it to make myself and make IBM far more relevant um, to, two, to two audiences. One, the role I was in at IBM was all focused on driving innovation into, into large financial institutions, primarily in London. So, so our, our mantra was, our, our vision, our requirement was, how can we find things that are relevant, things that people will take calls for? And, and of course, Bitcoin and the emerging cryptocurrency space w w was very hot. So I realized by, you know, by writing about it and you know, explaining it, because I spent a lot of time as an engineer trying to figure out how it all worked, explaining it on my blog and what it might mean. Um, it was useful, it was interesting, it was motivating for me, but it, but it worked, it helped me in my day-to-day -day job because it, you know, it, it, it drove opportunities for IBM. And then the flip side, because I, you know, I, I knew a fair bit about you know, how existing banking, legacy payment rails and things like that worked, you know, I found, well, actually, I can, I, can, I can help the other community as well. I can help the, help the Bitcoin community by, by writing about the, how the industry they're seeking to subvert or transform, how that works. So I remember you know, one of the pieces I wrote, that probably the first one I wrote that went viral, was, it was quite a simple piece, but it, you know, I, think it, it, I think it still stands up today. It was, it was just titled, you know, a simple explanation of how money moves around the financial system. And the idea was, you know, all these projects and, and companies who are seeking to rethink payments, uh, as many of them were doing back then, um, it was clear to me that not all, not all of them knew how payments worked today in the existing world. So I thought I could marry those two worlds. Um, long story short, fast forward um, you know, in 2015 at IBM, um, I'd kind of realized like many people had that if anything was going to happen in the enterprise space, you know, businesses were going to apply this technology to solve their own problems, you know, as opposed to using this technology to sort of like they become custodians or build their own exchanges, um, because there was a belief that they could and should, and maybe we'll come on to where that belief came from. If they were going to do that, they'd have to do it together. This is, this is a team sport. This is a network technology. Um, but we were just not set up as a firm back then to sort of bring together a collection of banks to do that work. Unbeknownst to me, at the back end of 2014, start of 2015, there was like a group of three, I guess, mad guys um, in New York, uh, David Rutter, um, Tom McDonald, and, and, and Jesse Edwards, um, the founders of R3, who were trying to do the same thing. And, and where I and the team I was working with at IBM had failed, you know, they succeeded, succeeded hugely, 
by persuading a, a large number of banks, you know, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of them, that the best way to figure out what this technology might mean to them is to work together, come together, come together with an innovative IP sharing scheme so that we could collaboratively work. And, and initially, it was just a one-year program, just a one-year project, just to figure out you know, what might be the applicability or, or opportunity for, for, in quotes, blockchain technology, because it wasn't defined back then, what might be the applicability to financial services. Um, so you know, David was, he was just pursuing me all the way through 2015. And in the end, I sort of just gave up and said, fine, I don't believe you'll do it. But if you get five banks to sign on the dotted line to, to join your consortium, then fine, I'll quit IBM and I'll join. Um, and then he not only went into that, by the time I'd left IBM, he had 12, then 39, and then dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Um, and um, and um, yeah, we'll come on to, I guess, more of what happened later. But that was, you know, that was my entry into R3, where I joined the CTO with a job to help help convene this group of senior motivated technologists from all these banks to figure out you know, what might the opportunity be. Um, and, and we've been on that journey ever since. Uh, so, you know, what's very interesting about this is IBM is one of the primary supporters and, and creators of, of the Hyperledger protocol. So, so uh, from, from a timeline perspective, were you involved in some of those early conversations or, or was this pretty much a perfect uh, gap between when you left and when they started to really invest in, in that project? It's a really good question. There was an almost complete separation, but um, and, and, and there was a separation on two levels. So one, um, back you know, by the time I left IBM in July, I think it was July 2015, um, Hyperledger didn't exist, but, but Open Blockchain did. That, that was the internal mm -hmm. IBM project mm -hmm. that became, you know, that was contributed to Hyperledger. Um, that was being driven um, primarily, in fact, almost exclusively out of IBM in the US. I think it was from the Raleigh Lab in North Carolina. So I was mm -hmm. aware of it. You know, I knew John Walpert, um, I knew John Walpert pretty well, I knew Jerry Cuomo, uh, but I, I wasn't involved in that team. Um, and I mean, as John will say, you know, one of the things I was considering was um, that, that there was an offer there to go and join that team. Uh, but that would have meant moving to, to, to North Carolina. You know, I wanted to stay in London. But I also had this, this second thought, which was you know, I'd been writing this. And I, I'd been guilty of this like many other people. I've been making the claim without justification, the assertion, if you like, without justification, that the technology underpinning Bitcoin could be relevant to banks. But the work, you know, the hard work to justify that, to firm that up and to turn it into something rigorous, that hadn't happened yet. You know, that in reality, that was, that was going to be the first, the, the, I subsequently discovered it was going to be you know, the, the work of the, the first year of R3. So it kind of struck me as, as premature to, to have all, at least it, for my feeling, it, it struck me as premature to have already built a platform that was very heavily influenced by Ethereum, but without the, without the token and so forth, the, the thing that became Fabric. And I thought, you know, what, I've not done the thinking yet. I don't actually know what the answer is. I don't know. What, it, mm -hmm. it, 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 it doesn't follow that something that was designed for this permissionless, unstoppable world computer, you know, Ethereum, you know, why should something that has a very similar design be relevant to finance? It's something in that distributed system space, in that consent consensus space, you know, bringing you know, all these different parties into consensus. There's something there, but, but, it's, but it's not ready to build something. It's not quite time to build something. So to so face between those two options to sort of like you know, help develop and uh, move forward with something that already existed or work with a huge group of potential consumers of the technology to figure out what might be needed, that the latter was more attractive, clearly more risky, you know, joining a startup that you know, my contract was a year, you know, we, we, the whole thing could have shut down after a year, but it felt, it felt far more exciting. Um, and that was, so I didn't have a great deal of involvement with the, the open blockchain team. You know, I attended a few client meetings, and, uh, but it was, um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was pretty limited. Um, um, but I guess it did, you know, it, it, that, that thought carried forward into R3 because if, remember, R3 was not started as a software company. That's what we've become. You know, we are now mm -hmm. a software company product is is the enterprise or the commercial version of Corda, which is an open source platform we built. Um, but the first few months, maybe the first year, spent figuring out what problem we're we trying to solve. And it was only then kind of reluctantly we realized we had to build something. And that thing we built became Corda because we realized here's the problem we're going to go solve and none of the existing technologies can solve it, even though they were the inspiration and helped us figure out that the problem existed and could be solved. So the, the, you know, there, there's uh, a lot to unpack in terms of what's on the quarter roadmap and, and kind of what's happened more recently, and, and we are going to get to that. Um, but before we do, I, I you know, th there was a mad rush to do blockchain, not Bitcoin, in 2015, right? And, and, and in some cases, maybe that was even like a necessary evil, uh, even if you're a, a, an enterprise blockchain skeptic. Um, which many people are, uh, and I'm somewhere on the fence because I do think that there's you know, always gray areas. But um, 
you could argue that that was a necessary evil just to institutionalize the concept of uh, the underlying technology that supports these new assets because you, you couldn't make that sale at an institutional level at the same time. You couldn't say, hey, there's this brand new technology and there's this brand new asset class. Like that was probably information overload. And, and so the, the net result was you ended up having R3, Hyperledger, um, some other enterprise focused platforms emerge that aim to kind of ease these institutions into it and at least create a, a regulatable sandbox of you know federated systems where, where you know different different players could just start to experiment. Um, how do you think about the current landscape of, of kind of m meaningful players in the enterprise blockchain space um, and and kind of where the subspecialties are are starting to align? And, and you know obviously you're you're going to be maybe partial in the answer. Um, and, and give a more you know, flowery version of, of kind of R3's place in the system, that's fine. But I think it's a helpful starting point just to, to help people grok um, that might be more focused on like Bitcoin and all of the cryptocurrencies. Where exactly um, Hyperledger fits into this, where R3 fits into this, where the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance um, or Liquid, you know, or, or the other kind of custom purpose built enterprise blockchains, um, currently stand uh, in, in terms of their uh, maturity and, and you know, ongoing experiments and adoption? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And um, I guess a wide open opportunity for me to be outrageously biased, but I'll, I'll, try, I'll try not to be. Um, maybe, maybe, there's, maybe there's two ways to come at this because cause you're right, you know, I was one of these people making you know, that blockchain, not Bitcoin arguments. Um, and I know said, said in isolation, you know, it, you know, it's, it, it doesn't sound credible and, it, and it's become very cliched. So you know, um, maybe if I you know, talk about the, the journey we went on and then how I see that, how to see the space, the, the enterprise in quite space looking now. But so, so there were probably like, there were two things we did in the early days of all three. And, and again, because you know, I felt so enormously privileged because we were not under pressure to, to ship something or deliver something. The output was the learning. The output was the the, the, the shared the, the, the shared knowledge we gained, and so we had the space to to to, to look at it. Um, and and there were kind of like two different things we did, and I think both of them came together. So so the first of them, first question we asked ourselves was, you know, to what end, to, to what business problem is Bitcoin the engineering solution? So okay, it looks like the first time you look at Bitcoin, it's it's like it's like alien, you know, to some extent it's like alien technology, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, it was designed by a human or humans. It is a solution to a problem. So so we asked ourselves yeah, to what problem is that the solution i'm going to come on to that in a second um because the um because i think that, that that has to be unpacked but um the second question was well let's look at how it works you know what are the various pieces you know how does this thing work how do all these different nodes come to consensus without a single identifiable party in the center you know making it so um and that second piece so is really you know is, is applied cryptography you know look at this combination of of deterministic execution of code transactions that reference their predecessors this idea of um, this idea of um, you know, consensus, people sharing data, you know, all the stuff that, that goes into Bitcoin and then Ethereum. And that second piece was, you know, if we were to generalize that, is that a potential solution to some hard, hard and unpleasant, intractable problems in finance that are related to anywhere where you have multiple people who should be in consensus about data, but, but actually aren't? Um, but I'll come to that second piece after, after doing the first, because that question, you know, to what, to what business problem is Bitcoin the solution? Um, it's a controversial thing to say in some, in some quarters, but for me, the, you can, if, if you ask yourself, how would I build a system of un unstoppable, so, you know, censorship resistant, confiscation resistant digital cash how would i build one of those systems um, i think that single sentence that single problem statement if you to work through the engineering of how you could build such a thing so you know censorship resistant so there can't be a single identifiable party in the center because if there was they, they could be shut down by the feds um digital cash so there can't be bank accounts so so it has to be a pure like you know pure a pure counterparty risk you know free asset all the rest of it by the time you've worked through the requirements you end up with bitcoin now, it took a specific genius to figure out what those moving parts were, but, mm -hmm. but it is the solution to the problem of, of uncensorable digital cash. Um, and you know, hence why a new consensus mechanism was required because all the traditional consensus mechanisms worked on the basis that you knew who the validators were, but if you know who the validators, if you know who the validators are, then of course you can shut them down. So, so there's kind of like a, that leads you to quite an interesting sort of interesting place though, because not a single bank or you know, large institution, company, telco, whatever it is, not a single organization I know, 
has the requirement for censorship resistance with digital assets. In fact, you know, they kind of have the anti-requirement. If they were to build one of those things, they'd all go to jail. So, so it was clear that um, simply you know, taking Bitcoin and trying to do the same thing but by removing the token, that was not what we were trying to do because that makes no sense. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. actually the censorship resistant part of Bitcoin that um, um, is, is kind of the weird thing because it, it's, you end up with you know, it, that whole technology stack was designed to solve a problem we don't have. But in designing that technology stack, um, Satoshi, like individual like group, showed us there's actually a new or perhaps like you know a more innovative way of building distributed systems between parties who don't fully trust each other that are in sync. And if we could take one of those and generalize it and make it applicable to business problems rather than the digital cash problem, suddenly a whole new universe opens up. Um, and I'm not probably not done a particularly good job of, of unpacking that, but but where, where it got us to was uh, we had we, we we got to our own problem statement. So just as Bitcoin is a well-designed solution to a business problem, we got to our own business problem, which was how would I build a platform that would allow parties to share facts, you know, deals, insurance claims, trades, um, cash balances, whatever they are. How would we build a platform that would allow parties to share facts, come into consensus about their existence, so the fact that someone owes some money alone exists come to consensus about the existence of that thing and then collaborate to maintain the records as they evolve over time so they maintain consensus. So, so we, we found our own requirement statement that was heavily influenced by that but was different. And so guess what? The solution we came up with, Corda, looks very similar in places to Bitcoin and Ethereum but it also departs in a few places because we're trying to solve a related but different problem. Still in the consensus space, still in the adversarial space, still in a space where we don't want unnecessary intermediaries. But but it wasn't designed to be a censorship resistant, counterparty risk free digital currency platform. It was designed to manage business agreements between regulated or identified institutions where one of those agreements might have been a contract for ownership of a security or it could be an insurance contract or something else. But it was about you know, putting these kinds of contracts on a legal footing in a way that was decentralized and completely consensus so two you know, almost like that's why i wrote a blog post a few years ago saying you know the enterprise space at least the way we characterize it at all three with quarter and, and the permissionless cryptocurrency space almost like you know, two revolutions two independent revolutions that were both inspired or sort of catalyzed by that you know that, that flash of genius 11 years ago by satoshi so, so i think that gets us um th that's probably the uh, necessary context uh, in terms of answering the, the question that I'd asked around set market segmentation, right? So, yeah, and, and, and market segmentation, you probably have to talk about use cases first, right? So there's, there's clearing settlement of securities, there's uh, clearing settlement of, of uh, intrabank transfers. Um, so, you know, disintermediating the correspondent banking system or just coming up with something that, that requires less working capital and, and improves the um, communications between these, these large financial regulated entities. Um, maybe, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll set supply chain, you know, logistics, uh, off in its own corner for now, because a lot of people talk about that, but, but really where the rubber meets the road for, for some of these big entities is on the securities and, and, and payment settlement front. Um, so where, where do the different pieces, you know, fit in? Because, um, we're going to get into some of the specific projects that you're working on with MasterCard and some of the, um, large central banks on, on, uh, central bank digital currencies. But, um, but, but there, there's you know, quite a lot that can be done at the enterprise space, which is hors d'oeuvres of magnitude larger than the current crypto market. Um, what's the general appetite right now and, and kind of what are these uh, enterprises trying to optimize for as they pick the platforms that make sense for them? Yeah, so I asked myself a very similar question at the back end of last year. So back end of last year, 2019, we've been, you know, we've been, we've been at this for four years at that point. So, so um, you know, I joined all three September 15, four years later, September 19. And, and, and that 2019, it really felt like the year where we really got proper traction with Corda. You know, when you're looking for signs of you no know, product market fit, you know, do you actually have the right thing or you know, people using it? 20, 2019 felt like the year that was happening. It was, it was a hard year. At the start of the year, um, we had a really difficult release. Quarter four was really hard to get out of the door. Um, 20, the, center, the middle of 2019, we had a lot of customers going live. Well, guess what? As you're getting live, it's difficult. You encounter problems. There's bugs to fix. And there's, there's approvals to go through. Um, and then at the back end of 29, um, we then had those customers who are now live. We needed to make sure they could upgrade and the like. So it was, it, it, it was, it was a hard year. And then the question I was asking myself was, okay, we've got people using this platform and they seem to be successful with it. We seem to be onto something. You know, we're 
winning projects from Hyperledger, we're winning them back from IBM. You know, when we go head to head with enterprise Ethereum platforms, we would beat them. You know, we made this bet that it was going to be only the open source platforms that succeeded because of the network effects. So, it's, so you answer your question about the enterprise blockchain space. There's kind of only three three credible you know, general purpose players: Corda from R3, Hyperledger, and, and enterprise Ethereum. And guess what? It's the ones with big communities with an open core at the heart of it. Um, but the question I asked myself, and this, this gets to, to, to your point, was what are people actually using Corda for? Because we, we, you know, we, we made some assumptions four years ago. We had a lot of input and help from the, these uh, hundreds of technologists who helped us design it. But even they could only you know, speculate. We've now got evidence, you know, what are people doing? And, and, and to your point, you know, some, of the, some of the things we designed Corda for were representation of cash on ledger, uh, processing, um, you know, post-trade processing of derivatives and, and securities and things like that. But, but the interesting thing was you know, that then th those things are happening and we have projects like that and we'll come on to them. But there's a whole sort of, there's two broad categories of, of projects that don't really fall into that, into, into that categorization. So, so the first are, are, um, are, you could call them almost, you know, inter-firm market level business processes. So this doesn't sound particularly sexy, but it, it turns out to be something that's a real problem that lots of people have been trying to solve. And it's only when something like enterprise blockchain, you know, Cordra in my case, came along that they could. Um, and this leads to a tokens conversation, but it gets there through a path you wouldn't expect. So, so an example might be, um, and hopefully this isn't, this isn't going into too much detail, one would be syndicated lending. So um, syndicated lending, what's an example that I need to, I need to build a bridge. I'm a big sort of a builder. Bridge maybe it's going to cost a billion dollars. No one's going to lend me that amount. You know, it's too risky. I need a collection of people to come together. Who's going to help me find that collection of lenders? Well, guess what? I'll go to a bank. The bank won't lend me the money, but they'll act, me as, act as an agent and they'll help find people who will lend it to me. Um, this is an inherently decentralized market. I can go to one of many agents to help me form this syndicate. They can go to, you know, so they can get to thousands of potential lenders. Um, so, you know, there's no CEO of that market. There's no one in charge. And as a result, it has this really interesting property that all the firms in that market are pretty well run, pretty well optimized, they've all got good technology, but the market itself is insanely inefficient because there's no one who's, there's, there's no one who's been able to enforce standardization across that market and there's no technology that would enable it except a technology that was deployed centrally and then you'd have someone in the center who saw all the data and would, would have massive power. So guess what? One of the large software vendors in that space, Finastra, has realized, you know what? I can use Corda to, to link all these participants together in a way. And this, and this is the thing that perhaps I didn't expect in a way that doesn't actually change the structure of the market. Nobody's disintermediated and no new um, parties are added. It, it just makes what currently exists more efficient. So you could think, well, that's not particularly exciting. Um, and that's not, you know, is, that, is that what Satoshi promised 11 years ago? You, you could get quite cynical about that. But you then look at where they're taking it. The idea is once you get that market to the level where the data is enough that you can trust it, suddenly all these loan records move from bits of paper and you know, dusty mainframes into each bank's um, data center. That, that shared ledger becomes the authoritative record of which loans exist, who owns which tranches, what interest payments are due. And suddenly you've got an authoritative record, which itself is, is nothing more than a collection of tokens on quarter that, that represent ownership slices of different loans which can now be traded and you've now got the basis of a new secondary market for the trading of slices of syndicated loans which is a multi-trillion dollar market um, so so you get to this you know this this possible that when they get to that phase this possible transformation of an entire market but you get to it through the hard and sort of almost tedious process of fixing broken processes but they're broken processes at the industry level at the market level that no previous technology could really fix because they they were designed to be deployed by individual firms not across them so, so I'll pause in case you got a question, but that was kind of like the first category of, of projects I was seeing last year. Sure, and, and, and this goes to my earlier point of, uh, you know, maybe the blockchain, not Bitcoin, emphasis on business processes um, was a, a necessary precursor to bridging the gap, right? So, so I always talk about the crypto asset barbell. It's kind of my mental model for the industry. You're going to have tokenized, tokenized securities like that you can value and and, and, and treat just like you would any other security. It's just, uh, it's tradable on a digital ledger uh, or serviceable on a digital le le ledger in the case of, of uh, syndicated loans. Um, on the other hand, you have purely digital native assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and some of these other platform tokens. Um, the, the enterprises will be best equipped to handle those uh, if they've built all the infrastructure around the unsexy blockchain, not Bitcoin, um, because the, the, the logical leaps and, and the kind of internal infrastructure development that 
needs to be made. Um, if you do it for a, a permission blockchain, the, the gap to go from permission to permissionless is much, much narrower than the gap to go from double entry to triple entry accounting, right? Um, so, you know, I, I guess where, um, what I'm most interested in is, is how can we get that path to interoperability? And, and, and maybe the best way to answer that is to look at um, just where you're seeing the most heat, right? Uh, obviously, you're not going to break down revenues. You can if you want, but I, I think, you, I think, you know, we, we have a mutual friend that would, you'd get in trouble for that. Um, but, uh, but how is R3 currently structured? Because um, you, you're, you're talking about a lot of big clients. You're talking about one cohesive uh, enterprise blockchain platform, but f maybe four primary use cases that, that seem to have uh, really come to the fore in, in 2019 especially. Um, we mentioned payments, we mentioned syndicated loans and clear settle, and then obviously the central bank uh, digital currencies. Are those different teams? Um, are, are these different implementations on, on top of R3? Uh, quarter or or uh, how you know I, I guess what's the market relative market size and, and percentage terms of, of where um, the the largest opportunities and the biggest kind of near term opportunities are in enterprise blockchain right now? Yeah, that's that's it's a good one. So so maybe there's a, just one other point to add to my previous answer, and that will then provide the context for mm -hmm. this. So so I see a lot of projects um, in as I say in sort of they start with trying to fix an industry level business process. And that's then the enabler for um, like in syndicated loans. And we see it in other projects as well to, to then, to then tokenize the resulting assets because they're now, they're now accessible and serviceable and, and tradable. Um, I also see projects that go straight for that price um, up front. And whereas the business process ones are kind of incremental. I talked about how there was, there was often no disintermediation kind of like the opposite of what you'd expect and the market structure doesn't change. I also see people going straight for the, the disruptive approach. And an example might be the Swiss digital exchange um so, so the subsidiary of six in switzerland and you know they they're doing something quite interesting also on corda which is you know, why i have visibility of it but i think that i think their idea is let's 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 just try and disrupt our own business before somebody else does it and and the idea is can we build a an integrated digital exchange where the act of placing a sell order for example for an asset that you own sufficiently immobilizes it that the second that order is crossed, the settlement happens immediately. So, so it is you, know, you end up with um, exchange without the need for clearing at all. So it's you know, it's 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 not just do what we used to do, but better or faster. It, it changes the structure of the market, um, and, and we're seeing that happen on on Cordra as well. Um, I guess the the bit maybe I should so I won't share. I mean, I, I get fired if I talk about revenues, but I but I can talk about business model because I know I had a long debate with um, Brian Bellendorf of Hyperledger and John Walford of Consensus on, on Twitter um, just earlier this month, uh, where we were sort of having a sort of friendly sparring session with each other about our respective business models and and, and the like. And the point I was making to them was um, we're we're unashamed about the fact that we are we are a software company. You know, we we make money when people choose to buy the commercial version of our platform um, and, and execute transactions on top of it. But I'm also not stupid. You know, this, is, this, is a, this is a platform technology. People have to build applications on top of it. You know, we don't build the applications that our partners do. And once it's deployed, there are network effects, just as like you know, everybody on the Ethereum network is running Ethereum. Everybody on the Corda network, which is our, our, our independent, independent foundation that manages um, Corda nodes, everybody on the Corda network is running Corda. If, if every single one of those nodes was proprietary, no one would ever consider installing it and the lock-in would be too great. So Corda is defined by the open source project. And then the challenge for us, the engineering team, for me, CTO, and for the sales team, is to, is to put enough value into the commercial version that individual participants in the network choose voluntarily to pay for the commercial version rather than using the free one. But the free one defines the protocol. Um, I say all that because you know, the way we succeed then is having as many people as possible deploying nodes. Why would they deploy a node? Because there's an application that solves a problem. Where do the applications come from? From third parties. We work with a whole collection of startups and existing software vendors and, and, and third parties who build the apps. Um, you know, we don't do that ourselves. Yeah. Sure. And, and, and like I said, I, I don't care uh, about the revenue, right? Someone else can scoop that, you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter to me. It, you, my, the, the bigger point that I'm trying to make is the market size is massive. So the revenue will be there if there's adoption. What, what's more interesting is um, think about uh, just market share in terms of attention, right? So, so in terms of prioritization at, at R3, um, if, if you were to split the pie, where, where is the focus going in 2020 and in the next couple of years when it comes to use case? 
um, and, and where the most kind of aggregate client demand is right now for, for solving things in a more timely manner than the typical five, 10 year enterprise adoption cycle that, that we're you know, in the middle of right now. Yeah, I think there's, it's an interesting one. I think there's been, there's almost like there's been three categories. So there's, there's been the bit that nobody sees, which is the, is, is the one-off investment. So um, it's almost like, you know, just, just the, the, the building the infrastructure for the next generation almost. So, so building core the network and the independent network, that was a cost we bore. We, you know, we, we funded the creation of that independent network. There's the one-off work to get Corda to the point where it can be approved for deployment by, by large firms and, and, and the like, and then getting Corda to the point where it's production ready. So that's kind of like a one-off cost that continues, but a lot of the heavy lifting is done. Um, if I look at what was going live and was being deployed last year, um, I think you're right. The majority of the projects were the, were the incremental you know, business process improvement ones, you know, the ones that don't sound sexy, but which we'll, we'll see huge, huge effects from in the future. But, but it's changing this year. And the, it's almost like the, the leading indicator is often developer activity. You, know, you, you find out from the sales team and from your customers phoning you long after the, the engineers have actually been writing code. And, and probably the thing that's caused the two things that have caused most interest in the last six months are, are Corda Settler, which is a way to um, settle transactions on Corda networks if you don't have an on-ledger um, asset. So that implies there's demand because if you did, you'd use that instead. So the, the interest in Settler told us there was a demand to be able to settle transactions on Corda. And then the so this, token, is this is what Six is using. Um, I I don't know. I think actually no no I do know because the second thing is is the tokens SDK. So this is something that, that Roger Willis and my team um, led the development of, um, which was um, sort of spearheaded and championed by Todd. And, and you can think of this as, it, it's too undersell it, but you can think of it as the core equivalent of the ERC family of, um, of, um, mm -hmm. of standards, ERC20 and so forth. And, mm -hmm. and, the, and the reason why I think that's where we're going to see a lot of the interest, increased interest um, this coming year is, you know, one, I know who's using it. And two, I also see though the, the issues we get through GitHub and, and the pull requests there. You know, there, there are people who are, the people are building their apps on top of this thing because it's now a common way to represent digital assets on Corda. And of course, it's not, this is the thing, I think, again, some, something people sometimes miss. It's not enough to have a standard for you know, what, an, what an asset looks like, a you know, token, who's the issuer, what's the name, how many decimal points and how many commas and things. Mm -hmm. it's, it's also the workflows that go around it. You know, if it's going to be issued, who issues it? If it's going to be redeemed, you know, what needs to have happened? All that kind of stuff has to be encoded as well. And, and that's all in the token SDK. So that was a long answer to your question, which is, um, I think the market has very much underestimated the power and just like how much, how much value there is to be sort of like captured by, by, by fixing the industry business process problem. Um, but the amount of interest we're seeing in tokens tells me that's where the growth is going to be this year. Yeah. And uh, the genesis for this call, really, uh, yeah. you're, you're, you're at least um, on an announced basis working with, with two larger uh, and more uh, forward thinking central banks, really. So it seems um, on their central bank digital currency plans. What can you say, aside from the fact that these were announced and that the kind of development is ongoing about uh, the, the work that's going on with MAS in Singapore and, and the ECB uh, and the European Union? Um, so I must admit, I'm not as familiar with the work with ECB. So um, I'll, I'll talk about MAS, but also I'll talk about um, Thailand. So Bank of Thailand has been doing a project called Project Inthanon, um, where they've been looking at um, working with, I think, the eight major banks in Thailand to issue central bank currency onto, onto a quarter ledger. Um, maybe start with the MAS one, because I think they're now into phase five. Um, sorry you know, sort of like phase five of the project and we were not involved in that one but we were involved in you know, some of the previous ones and and that's been interesting because it's i guess this is maybe this is typical of, of how, how, how the, of the singaporean government runs itself but the the methodical way they've been going through that has been fascinating the, the first thing my my attention was first drawn to this a couple of years ago when one of the phases it was all about um it was about it was about netting because this is, again this is going to sound it's going to sound i guess probably sound boring but it's it's so it's the problem that arises when you move to to full bearer assets because you know, why do why do some payment systems settle net you know, why is it that money doesn't money doesn't move gross like it does across the Bitcoin network why is it sometimes a payment takes a while and it has to go through a batch cycle well the answer is of course because it's it's very expensive from a liquidity perspective you know every time you want to make a payment you have to have the money ready to go um, even though you know you're going to get somebody else to pay you a bit later sometimes it's better to batch these things up and net them and you can transmit between multiple parties a lot of value without actually having to have that much on hand at any given time I guess it's the reason for things like you know the lightning network and Bitcoin and so forth and, and 
the Singaporean government um, uh, realized that. And one of the early phases of um, Mabubin wasn't just, hey, can we issue the Singaporean dollar onto a blockchain? It was, can we do it in a way that doesn't completely destroy the, um, the liquidity of all the banks who do it? Can we actually show that liquidity savings mechanisms and netting can be done in a way that works um, It works with the grain of the blockchain? So you know, one of the things um, we did, in fact, I think, I think the engineer who did it submitted a patent application that I can't remember now is, is Dave Hudson, who now leads our engineering team, um, built, I think, the world's first decentralized netting scheme so all the quarter nodes could use the business process engine that we built for a different purpose but they're able to talk to each other and figure out without revealing any um, you know, any private information you know, what the netting cycles were so you could settle as many transactions as possible as fast as possible whilst keeping within some limits so I say all that because you know, mm-hmm. on, on the outside it looks like hey wouldn't it be great just to be able to issue um, a central bank currency either on a wholesale basis or a retail basis but when you scrape to the detail below it and look at what you need to do in terms of you know, a netting and all the other things it, it, from an engineering perspective which i guess is where i say it, it's absolutely fascinating well you you can't introduce a bearer instrument like bitcoin uh without some lending infrastructure uh or nostra vostro infrastructure between the banks that are, are actually going to use this right mm. um because you're you're they're two totally different things if, if, if the whole reserve banking system is built on uh, you know, creating new loans uh, and, and maintaining a reserve ratio. And all of a sudden you, you introduce an asset where the reserve ratio has to be 100%. Um, it's, it's kind of a non-starter. Right? It, 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 it is, but let's imagine, let's imagine it we're still based on a lot of the liquidity benefits as well. Yeah, sure. But let's imagine we still had a, all that, you know, fully backed sort of gold-based central banking system. Um, it would still, be, and let's imagine you had to deliver gold to the bank every time you wanted to make a payment. Um, if you were able to batch up the payments and, and do it net, you'd have to carry fewer bags of gold through the, the, the streets of the city of London. But of course, the downside is it introduces some credit risk. It slows things down. So there's, there's this mm-hmm. trade-off. Yeah. Um, so that was, you said that was phase one? Uh, or that was one of the earlier phases, and I think they're now up to phase five, um, which I need to... But you're, to not, you're, you're not involved anymore? Not in that particular phase. I think we'll get re-engaged. Also, we will re-engage, but um, you, sometimes you have to figure out where do, you, you know, where do you put your efforts. So we worked on the first four. We didn't engage in the fifth, and I think we'll, I think we'll be back again soon. Um, how, how many phases do you, uh, do you think you, you'll, you'll see for something like MIS until something actually goes live? I don't know if it's 20 phases. I don't know if it's mirroring the experimentation, like live phase or, or, or what. I, sure answer, I don't know. Um, I'm, yeah, I probably, given, given that I wasn't involved in the last phase, I probably know the one to talk about that, but it's a fair question. Yeah. Uh, where did you leave things at phase four? Um, you know what? Um, <laughs> This is going to sound really weird, given that this is a conversation about CBDC. The answer is I don't actually know, but I can follow up afterwards. I'll get told to give me the answer to it, and I'll, I'll slack you the message. Got it. Okay. Well, we can, we can always throw that in the, uh, in the show notes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, what, what are, uh, I'm sure, as you track the different CBDC initiatives in general, uh, given the work that you have uh, you know, with these different you know, major parties, um, what is your impression of, of who is farthest ahead here? Is, is it, in fact, China? Do you have any insight into what's going on with their PCP, um, uh, electronic payments currency, and the, the new digital yuan? Uh, are there any other parties that are, are a little bit ahead of them from a go-live standpoint? Um, what, uh, what should we be thinking in terms of the, the actual uh, timeline to, to start seeing at least the pilots here because the, the top rumor is probably that you will see something in at least a couple of provinces in China at some time some <coughs> Yeah, short answer again. I, I don't know. Um, China, I'm I'm not close to that one. Infinon seems pretty far forward. Um, I don't know where that is. You know, head to head against um, neck and neck against um, MAS. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, something that I mean, and, and openly a debate we have internally a lot is is the the relative speed of retail CBDC against wholesale. So wholesale CBDC again, it's you know it's it's, it's in some ways less interesting because you know, um, you know wholesale banks, you know, sort of commercial banks already have access to and typically have access to a central bank account. So you could say mm-hmm. this is this isn't changing anything structurally. It maybe just makes it easier for them to settle with each other. Um, and I see those projects are probably further along. Um, you look at retail CBDC. I mean, that gets that gets really interesting. But what I've not seen complete engagement with yet, probably across any, you know, certainly this is me looking from the outside because you know CTR I'm not involved in all the client projects. Is, is, is questions that sound, they sound quite
quite basic, but it's things like, okay, so if you have a, a consumer with a wallet that owns some CBDC, they, they lose their phone, have they lost their money, or is there a way to sort of recover it? Does that, if there's a way to recover it, okay, outside perhaps sort of like, you know, the, the sort of like the social key recovery mechanisms that kind of work, but may not. Does that mean the central bank has to open up a call center, or do they do it through the commercial banks? Some of those models, I think some banks are further along, but I don't think, you know, I don't think anybody's got all the answers to that yet. There's, there's, a, there's a lot to be done. It's not enough to say, yeah, we'll have consumer wallets. You've really got, you've really got to think through about the fact that you know, people can't look after their house keys. They lose their phones. They run out of charge. They get mugged. You need to have an answer for what happens if something goes wrong. And the, you know, the, the, the Bitcoin approach of, you know, your keys are, the, are, are everything. It, it, it's clearly you know, that's, that, that, that's, that's not the answer for someone who's, um, who's just lost all their money. Are, um, are you still working with Ripple at all? As a as a company, I know that there was you know some extracurricular you know activity that was working its way through the courts, but um, and, and and it's since been resolved. But but uh, I'm curious if there's ongoing discussions since one of their primary focuses is on the the uh, interbank settlement component that you're also touching. So frankly, Ripple is probably the only uh, topic I'm. I'm I just I can't talk about it. Um, so <laughs> I, uh, I just I just I just, it's, uh, it's, it's, I just don't talk about it. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I'll I'll take that to mean that that uh, you uh, are likely not working together um, at the the corporate level. But um, we'll uh, we'll steer clear of that, and, and maybe we'll wrap up on the use cases uh, on the back to the kind of tokenized security element. Um, so the the wholesale and kind of back end institutional process we've kind of covered well. Yes, it's a little bit unsexy and it's not as glamorous, but it's kind of the meaningful uh, picks and shovels mm -hmm. uh, the business that needs to be built first. When do you think um, a quarter backed token will, will first begin trading on some retail accessible exchange, right? It could be a, a interesting. lending instrument. It, it could be, a, um, you know, a lot of people are talking about tokenized real estate. Um, it, is that, uh, something that, that you will power uh, in the near to medium term, or is, is the focus still just going to be on the, the, the infrastructure? And, and let like the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance um, and you know, some of the, the you know, more um, crypto asset focused companies uh, do the initial pilots there. That's a really good question. So, um, for your for your listeners and viewers, I've, I've mentioned um, a guy who many of them will know, but um, maybe not all. Tom Tom McDonald, our, our co-founder, and it kind of feels like for some of this, what I'm doing is like it's kind of setting up a follow-up interview for him because he could he could wax lyrical about this. Uh, from a technical perspective, I, I kind of like have a, a collection of, of principles for, for for what what good examples here would look like. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a whole collection of funds live on Corda Network. You know, I took a look at whether it's, you know, it's HQLAX with baskets of, um, of of government bonds and so forth. Um, I don't know if there's any plans for them or others to issue those tokens on you know, retail-focused exchanges, but there's nothing preventing that. Now, these are these mm -hmm. are, these are accessible. Um, in, in, at least if they're retail accessible, there's no technical reason why not probably something we may not see in the in the medium term or the short to medium term though is it was quarterback tokens carried on the public blockchain so take you know would you have like an elc20 token that is backed by something on quarter it's possible there's again there's no there's, there's no technical reason why you couldn't except that there's there's almost like a philosophical problem or a, a problem almost that arises from the original censorship resistance piece which is the probabilistic settlement um, consequences of a proof of work and possibly also a proof of stake. So if I look at a lot of the projects we're doing, yeah, yeah. almost like a non-negotiable requirement is that when the underlying platform says a trade is settled, you never get to a point where it becomes unsettled or, or unconfirmed. And you know, with, with core, we have that. I'm, I'm sure the fabric um, claims the same, but you don't have that on, um, on, on, on the public networks, hence all these heuristics about how many blocks you're waiting for. So, so there's probably some work we should do uh, as a community to figure out either you know, to what extent do, or when do we believe Ethereum 2.0 or wherever it is will, will give us settlement finality. You know, will it ever, if it will, by when? Or if not, you know, how, do, how do we bridge the impedance gap mismatch between what the public networks can offer and what you know, institutions actually need, which is finality? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk about the, the final partnership that was kind of meaningful um, that, that you were involved with last year uh, on the MasterCard side. So what, um, what is the specific engagement with MasterCard um, and, and how is it different from some of the other uh, banking uh, 
uh, payment pilots that, that you've been working through uh, since day one. So the Mastercard one, card one's fascinating. They, they, I, I didn't expect this to happen, but they, they actually attended our, our customer conference last year and presented um, on, on their plans. And um, all the videos are will be recorded and they're on our YouTube channel, so, so it's, it's not secret. And, and the thing I, I'd not realized, and, and maybe not everyone has, is you know, when I think of Mastercard, I think of the card network, I think of Mastercard Visa, or Amex, you know, I think in terms of you know, plastic cards and so forth. What I'd missed is, though, they also own a lot of domestic payment schemes. So in the UK, for example, they own Vocalink, who run faster payments and the link network for, for cards. So they, and, and, they, and my understanding is they have some of these in other countries as well. And the idea is, well, if we've got, if, if we've got the ability to, to manage payments domestically in different countries, can we, can we stitch these things together to allow us to offer you know, cross-border payments using the infrastructure we already have? So, um, so quarter to link the existing investments and infrastructures they have in different countries is, is the basis. Is, I mean, they can do a much better job of presenting it than I can, but that's the basic idea. Um, but but the, the key to understanding it is realizing there are a lot more than just a card company. Awesome. Um, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to finish with uh, a juicy topic and, and try to stir up as much uh, trouble as possible as, as you'd, you'd actually uh, said that you were open to. So, um, so we're going to push the envelope where we can. Um, there, you mentioned the, the thread with John Wolpert uh, and, uh, and Brian Pielendorf, who are the, the kind of heads of EEA and, um, and, and Hyperledger right now, or at least some of the principles. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what's missing in Ethereum, uh, right? So, so what, what are the trade-offs that for the foreseeable future you will have to make if you're engaging with a public blockchain versus what you're going to get with a private implementation. Um, because I, I still think that this is misunderstood or uh, people are talking past each other quite frequently mm -hmm. uh, when they, when they you know, kind of weigh the merits of, of working on an open system um, versus one that at least to start is, is federated or, or kind of consigned to a group of, of entities that um, maybe don't even trust each other, but just trust that they are all regulated so they won't break law and they will kind of opt into the same a similar uh, common standard. Yeah, sure. So, and I'll try and do this in a way that isn't just, "Hey, Richard's going to pick, you know, sort of pick holes in, in someone else's technology," because it, it's easy mm -hmm. to do, and it's it's not edifying. Um, although it is fun, uh, but uh, if I. If maybe one thing though is, is yeah, I think, and this, is, and this is my fault because I've done a bad job of, of explaining what we're up to in this regard. Um, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't accept the you know, the open versus something else characterization because you know it's one, it's I, I, I don't think it's the right dimension to argue over, but also it, it's not accurate. So when I talk about commissioned and permissionless, and, and it's the same with you know, is Bitcoin. You know, in what way is is Bitcoin or Ethereum permissionless? Very specifically and narrowly, and, and this is the key to it, is you don't need permission to be a validator. Anybody can be a miner on those, on those networks. That is the key to the censorship resistance, because if you don't need permission to be a validator, even if all the other ones are shut down, other people can come in. They can just, like a hydra, they, people can keep coming back. So, so the essence of those networks, the permissionless essence of those networks, is you don't need permission to be a validator and you get censorship resistance. Um, but at the same time, you know, anybody can connect to the code, anyone can connect to the Ethereum network or the Bitcoin network. Um, and, but the permissionless is about the, uh, the validation. You look at Corda, yes, you can, and I'm sure it's the same with Fabric, but let's talk about Corda. On Corda, yes, you can build completely closed wall networks where they're the only people on those networks or sort of like six banks trading bonds or whatever it is. Um, but the permissioned aspect of Corda is, 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 is specifically related to finality. Um, uh, by which I mean, we don't have censorship resistance as a goal. Um, we, 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 we aspire to, to be used in, 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 you know, in the world where we've got businesses who, who need to be able to control which transactions get confirmed. So, so the permissioned nature of Corda is you always know who's running the notaries, as we call them, which are the, the, the pools of distrusting entities that confirm transactions. But you look at the, the biggest deployment of Corda, which is Corda Network, you know, we call it the global internet of Corda Notes. Any company, we targeted at companies to start with, any company that is incorporated anywhere in the world um, can get a node on that network. There's an asterisk there about the you know, US sanctions list. You know, so there's, 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 there's a little barrier you have to get over. Um, but it's not like you've got to be some highly regulated sort of bank you know, in a list of 42. 
any company that is not on a sanctions list can get a quarter node on quarter network and transact with anybody else. Um, and they do. So it's like, and, and if you think about what you get, then you get an identity layer, you know who you're talking to, you get certainty of finality because the consensus is, is a permission consensus process, but anybody can be on the network. And then on, on node by node basis, you decide who you want to talk to and which apps you install. So, so, um, so I do want your listeners and, and viewers to, to, to realize that you know, Cordera is, I think, a lot more open than the people assume it is, probably because of the way we've described it. That all said, you know, what are some of the reasons why people don't use the same public Ethereum network? So one is the one I've talked about, which is um, the censorship resistance piece leads to permissionless of validators, permissionlessness of validators, which leads to um, uh, probabilistic finality. And, and I'm entirely unconvinced that even the move to proof of stake will fix that. And then there are some technical reasons as well. Um, we, 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 we obsess about privacy and, and the way we, we, we create private transactions on Corda, in addition to all the advanced techniques that are coming down the line, you know, um, whether it's um, Intel SGX, zero knowledge proofs, but just at a base level, the way we get privacy is by the data being very atomic, individual transactions, individual states just go to where they need to go. That's very similar in, in essence to how Bitcoin worked. Ethereum has this global shared computer idea. It's much harder to shard and you get all these like these, these, these Baroque and Byzantine designs for Ethereum too to, to fix that. So the privacy model is, is fundamental in the architecture. And then maybe the third one, because you know, you by, by, so, by that you're, you're talking about the difference between the, the UTXO model yes. and Cal model, right? Exactly, um, exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's, that's interesting because I know that this debate happened at, at Hyperledger as well, right? Whether to go with a Cal or, or UTXO based. Mm. Um, and and I'm, I'm sure many of the, of the listeners here will, will understand the difference, but, but Bitcoin is unique in that um, you create Bitcoin through what are called coin-based transactions, not to be confused with the company. Um, there's a coin-based transaction every single block that's also known as the minor reward or the you know, inflation rate in the system. And then every single time those transactions are spent, you destroy the old unspent transaction outputs and then you have new ones that could be broken up into little pieces and, and you know, progressively um, over time, really the, the, the state of addresses that you care about in the Bitcoin network are the unspent transaction outputs, the provable unspent transaction outputs, because that's your kind of current circulating supply. Um, Ethereum is a little bit more like a bank account where um, you're not daisy chaining these transactions together so much as just monitoring the quote unquote state of the system so that you have an accurate snapshot of what the account balances are at any given time for either an individual or a smart contract. Um, so that that uh, structural difference, it sounds like it's boring but important here. So, so why, why is the UTXO model superior um, for Corda and, and for privacy in general versus um, Ethereum incorporating some of these new technologies like zero knowledge proofs? Because there, there are privacy um, implementations that are, are currently working or, or soon to be working, at least in testnet, um, that, that are on Ethereum. And, and I'd imagine you, you ultimately see more and more of that over time. Yeah, sure. And, and, and I, I don't want to, I, so maybe I should take a step back to say um, Corda is also designed to, to work with zero knowledge proofs. The way we design our transaction structure means that when, when the right type of general purpose proofs become proof technology, if you like, becomes available, they can be plugged in. It's also been designed to use um, you know, secure hardware techniques from, um, you know, from Intel SGX or, um, or, or um, you know, other approaches like that. But, but all of these things are, are in the future and we've got customers live now. Now. So when we were designing it, we wanted to make sure as well that the, you know, the vanilla deployment, you know, how it works out of the box, offers good enough privacy to be able to get through approvals and to, and to get live. And, and I thought you did a really good explanation about the difference between the two. Um, the, 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 it's like the implication of what you just said is um, if you're because of the account based model, if you're an Ethereum node, in order to satisfy yourself that anything is correct, you need to verify everything and, and have a view of the whole world. Um, because you know, if one account's been incremented, you need to have seen the account that was decremented. But if that today but to know what its balance was, you had to know what happened before that. And before you know it, to be able to process one Bitcoin, one Ethereum transaction, you need to have the whole state of the world, you know, in, in your on your node, if you like. Um, and, and a lot of the work in Ethereum 2.0 is trying to figure out how to unpick that and how to do other things. Um, in Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin happens to share all transactions with everybody. Um, and a part of that is, is efficiency. Part of that is part of that is because of the permissionless nature. So there's a, I, don't want to, I, don't, I don't want to conflate too many of these things. But if you just want to ask yourself whether a particular Bitcoin output is valid, 
the the only data you need to see is that and all its historical um, transactions, which in many cases is not very many. So you don't need to have seen the entire state of the Bitcoin world to know whether any given transaction is valid. Now, for other reasons, because you need to know what you, know, you need to know what proof of work, you know, target, and everything is from, because of the, um, the the permissionless nature of it. You do need to see everything, but just to answer the validity question, you only need to see the history of that transaction. So we took that insight into Corda and said, well, actually, you know, a lot of the things that we're modeling on Corda are either things like you know, legal contracts, but they only move between a very small number of organizations or their tokens that have identifiable issuers and can often get redeemed and reissued. The, the actual lengths of these chains and the, the, the degree to which they fork as you walk backwards, um, you know, empirically, it's just not that big. So you can actually only move the data around lazily. It's sufficient to prove to people certain facts. So you end up with this almost like this, this, like this, this almost like fractal Venn diagram where each node on the Corda network has a very small subset of the overall set of, um, of data. You just have the bits you need to, 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 to convince you that you own certain things or that you're part of certain contracts. So um, because we don't have because we don't have proof of work, we don't have that permissionless piece, um, there's no need to see all the blocks, all the data, because that, that's just not a concern. So net net, by atomizing the data down to these individual outputs that can represent individual legal agreements or contracts or you know, cash states, whatever they are, you can massively sort of, um, so it's almost like, you know, almost like infinite sharding, you just have the subset of data you like. It's not perfect. For some use cases, we still need the advanced techniques, but it's surprising how many um, situations it actually works well in. Well, Richard, I, I was doing a bit of an experiment with this episode. I'm not going to lie to you. And I thought um, if, if, if anyone can make the enterprise landscape understandable uh, and, and, and hopefully uh, explain things concisely enough so that you know, your eyes don't glaze over and, and, and we don't kind of totally lose the audience that would have been you know, this conversation with you. Um, I, uh, I know, uh, I, I think it was a terrific one. Maybe I'm too in the weeds. We're gonna find out. Uh, and we'll see what the reaction was. Um, but, uh, but, but I guess for, for closing thoughts now, um, is there anything that we didn't cover that we absolutely should have? We covered a lot of territory in this conversation, but, uh, but parting words or parting shots, if, if, if you like. I don't think so. There's about five other things I could tell you about that I don't like about other platforms, but that's, 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 that's the wrong thing to do at the end. And I know that mine's not perfect either, so it's easy to, um, it's easy to, uh, to, to take shots at other people. So no, it, it, it's been great catching up, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, Richard Brown, CTO of R3, at Gendal, G-E-N-D-A-L, if you want to listen to more of his uh, debates with some of the other enterprise blockchain leaders on, on Twitter, which is where all great discussion happens. Um, anyway, uh, Richard, thanks again for joining us. Uh, all viewers, thank you for the support and tuning in once again on another episode of Unqualified Opinions. Until next time, peace. <laughs>